see all of you this morning congregating and visiting one another, and some with masks and some not with masks. It's good to see everyone this morning. Um, I have a few announcements this morning, so bear with me. Um, hymnals are back, as you can see. Um, so we want you to uh, please pay attention to the screens as the hymnals will, uh, the hymnal page numbers will be uh, presented uh, on the screen, um, depending on which hymn number will be uh, at the time. And so moving on, Tuesday's men's prayer group will be at 11 a.m. Uh, Tuesday's brown bag Bible study will be at 1215. Pre please bring a sack lunch and tea will be provided. We will have Wednesday noon uh, midweek encourager posts to Facebook and on YouTube by 12 p.m. We also have Saturday noon prayer, which is open to everyone. Um, if you would look into your bulletin, we also have an addition that has been made. Some has been asking for more space to write their notes. And so we have given you something very special. We've added a blank sheet of paper so you can write your extra sermon notes on. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, Hems Ray, who's passed away, um, his funeral will be at Coleman Funeral Home at 626 Star Landing Road in South Haven. The visitation will be from 5 to 6, and the funeral will be from 6 to 7. On Monday. On Monday. All right, let us bow for prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, God, we thank you so very much for your spirit, power, and anointing. We do pray in Jesus' name that you will fill this auditorium with your glory, and Father, in return, your people here will give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Well, hello. How are you this morning? Good. Oh, head shaking. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, as you have your hymnals back, if you want to turn to page 130, we're going to sing Here I Am to Worship. And if you want to stand up with us, um, that would be fantastic as well.
is fantastic. All right, our next song is going to be number 245 at Calvary.
part of the keyboard, but I still want you to sing, okay? So it's number five, so just one page over. Um, so sing with us as we sing How Great Is Our God. coming from Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. Now I'll be reading from the Holman Christian Standard Version. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to bring the rebellion to an end, to put a stop to sin, to wipe away iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince, will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be rebuilt with a plaza and a moat. But in difficult times, after those 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and will have nothing. The people 
ruler of the coming prince will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come with a flood, and until the end there will be war. Desolations are decreed. He will make a firm covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and offering. And the abomination of desolation will be on a wing of the temple until the decreed destruction is poured out on the desolator. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ronnie. Have a seat. Ah, good. Good. I'm delighted to see you this morning. Grateful you're here. Um, you know, I, I, I really wish that all of our questions could be answered clearly and with great certainty about the end times. But God has chosen for his purposes not to reveal all of the answers to us. This is where faith comes in. As we look at the end times, over these next several weeks, we're going to be looking uh, at, 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 at the end times and questions about the end times and personages and prophecies about the end times and, and just how some of these things are going to play out. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, God has given us enough information to get us way on down the road toward understanding the book of Revelation to where we can trust him, we can believe him, and we don't have to have any doubts about what's, what he's going to be doing in the end times, what's going to be happening with us in the end times. Uh, you know, I, 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 love the, I love the study of the end times. I remember... Uh, as, as, a, as a teenager, my mother teaching on the end times uh, in, in her Bible studies. I remember, uh, I remember our pastor teaching on the end times and teaching on all of the, all the different aspects of the end times and the prophecies and how Jesus is coming soon. And I believed it back then. I am 50 years past that now, and I believe it more today than I did then. Because that means we're 50 years closer to Jesus coming back than we were back then. Well, Pastor, it, 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 it's been a long time, don't you? Don't you doubt sometimes? Nope, I don't. Because God said he's coming back. I don't have any, I, I, I have no reason to doubt. I, I don't have the luxury of doubting. I believe it because God said it. And that, that settles it for me. I'm fine with that. And if, 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 God, uh, if, if God delays another thousand years, that's not going to bother me. If God comes back in the next ten minutes, that's not going to bother me. That is not going to shake my faith. Because God said it. And we can believe it. So we want to uh, look at the verses that Pastor Ronnie uh, has, has read to us, and I appreciate him <clears throat> reading so clearly and succinctly. And, uh, you know, the, the, uh, Daniel is such a key to understanding prophecy uh, and understanding the return of Jesus. And the end times, and it and it starts. That understanding really starts with these three verses, because these three verses form the skeleton of prophecy. All the rest of the of the prophetic scriptures provide the meat on the skeleton. Okay, provides the meat on the skeleton. Uh, uh, Revelation, Ezekiel, the, uh, the Olivet Discourse that Jesus taught his disciples in, in Matthew 24 and 25, 
First uh, and Second Thessalonians. All of these prophecy passages are only understood when we have a foundation of Daniel 9. And so, I'm not going to be real detailed this morning, all right? This is more of a, this is like a 35,000 foot view, okay? This is, this is kind of what you see when you fly in an airplane. And so we're not going to have an awful lot of details this morning. I want to give an overview today, and you notice in your bulletin, this is week one. Next week is week two. So there, I'm not going to finish this morning. I'm going to finish what you've got. You're not going to go home with empty blanks. But next week we'll continue, but just simply for time's sake. All righty? And, and so looking here in Daniel chapter 9, uh, one, of the, one of the foundational truths that we have to understand is that, that when Daniel talks about there in verse 24, 70 weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city. 70 weeks. That is a prophetic language and it actually means 70 weeks of years. Okay? 70 weeks of years. So what Daniel is talking about here is 490 years. And that, that'll mess with your mind just a little bit until you figure out it's okay. Uh, pastor's not the only one who thinks that, uh, that, that that's the way it is, all right? Most Bible scholars agree that this is talking about years and not just seven-day weeks. Uh, and so 70 weeks of years, 490 years. Now, God started off this, this 70 weeks with a 70-year period that we know as the Babylonian captivity. When King Nebuchadnezzar came into Jerusalem and took captive lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of Jewish people, chained them together. Some of them, they used giant fish hooks and pierced them through their pierced them through their thigh muscle here and then the fish hooks were attached to chains and that that made sure that nobody ran off because regardless how long the chain was or how short the chain was you had to get however many people were with you to run at the same speed faster than an arrow could fly to get away. So it wasn't a, you know, running away and escaping was not a real option, was it? And so the, the Jews had been, had been ruled in the Holy Land. They had been ruled by some of the Amalekites and the Amorites and some of the other ites that had defeated them after they had after the Jews had conquered the land and were living in the Holy Land that had been promised by God. But now, King Nebuchadnezzar came along and hauled off a mess of them to Babylon. And he left just a remnant of people in Jerusalem. And for the first time, the Holy Land was not controlled by the Jewish people. They were gone for the most part. King Nebuchadnezzar burned the city. He tore down the temple, hauled off all of the treasures that God had, uh, that, that uh, Solomon had built into the temple, hauled it all as, as booty into Babylon. It was now the spoils of war. 
four main characters that are very familiar with us. Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and I forgot the other Iah. <laughs> we know him more nearly as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? And so these, these guys were hauled off out of Jerusalem into Babylon, into captivity. Some people that, who were famous, like Jeremiah, was left in Jerusalem. And he became the prophet to the remnant in, that was left in Jerusalem. But Daniel and his buddies were hauled off. They were drafted into government service. And you remember all the, all the Bible lessons there of how God just worked miracle after miracle after miracle. And for, for the 70 years that Daniel was in Babylon, he served in the government. He served in the pagan government under four pagan kings. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah had sent a, uh, a letter to the exiles in Babylon. He preached this to the remnant of folks who were in in Jerusalem, but then he wrote it under God's inspiration and sent it to Daniel and the and the exiles there in Babylon. In chapter 29, he says, uh, this is what the Lord God, um, the God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile from, from Jerusalem into Babylon. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Whoa. Whoa. This is going to take a while. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give them your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. He's talking generations and generations. Also, uh, he, said, uh, he said, increase in number. Do not decrease. Don't just die off there in captivity. Have babies. Hey, let your babies have babies. And let's keep the numbers up because I've got a plan. I've got a plan, God says. Also, this is, this is so cool. Seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I've carried you in exile. Seek peace in Babylon. Seek peace with Babylon. I've got a plan. I want you to get along with the folks who stuff those hooks through your legs. I want you to get along with those people who have beaten you and tortured you and kidnapped you and hauled you off. I want you to forgive them in the name of God and become they're friends because I have a plan. And he goes on to say, when 70 years are completed for you in Babylon, I'll come for you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to Jerusalem. You're going to be there 70 years. You're going to be there 70 years. Get busy. Let's have some babies. Whatever you do, do it right like you're working for God, not just for the Babylonians. Buy a house. Fix it up. Decorate it however you want. Plant a garden. You're going to need it. Make yourselves at home. And this was part of God's plan. At the end of these 70 years, God spoke to Daniel and said, I'm getting ready to bring my children home. I'm getting ready to bring my children home, back to Jerusalem. You tell them, 
get their hearts right with me. I want them holy and pure when I bring them back to the holy land. And then God explained to Daniel, he said, I've got another plan that's coming into play. And this plan is not going to be just 70 years. This plan is going to be 490 years. 490 years. 62 <coughs> weeks of years. Okay? And it's going to culminate at the second coming of Jesus. It's going to culminate when Jesus comes. So God's, God's new plan for Israel started when King Artaxerxes in Babylon called in Ezra, and Ezra records this in chapter 7 of his book, and he said, I've watched you as a priest here in Babylon. I've watched you minister to your people. I've watched you minister to your God. And your God has spoken to my heart, this pagan king, your God has spoken to my heart, and I'm going to send you back to Jerusalem. And I want you to carry with you as many people as you would like to carry, as many people as want to go. You send them back. I want you to rebuild the city. I want you to rebuild the wall. I want you to rebuild the temple. And I will pay for it. Wow. Now that's a pretty good plan. And God put all that into motion. God put all that into motion. So it would start God's, God's second plan. Now this wasn't plan B. Don't make it sound like that. But God's second stage in his plan for Israel started when Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, when uh, Artaxerxes made that decree. And 490 years later, Messiah would come. And the Bible scholars who understand the the months, the, the Jewish months, and I don't understand them all. I'm, I'm very grateful I get January, February, March, okay? I'm grateful I understand this. I don't understand uh, the month of Nisan and the month of, uh, 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 I just don't. I'm not that smart. Uh, I'm, I'm a southern boy, and it's I, I'm okay with that. But the Bible scholars have taken those Jewish months, and the Jews used a different kind of year. They used a different calendar. Their, their calendar only has 360 days in their year, whereas ours has 365 and a quarter days, right? That quarter day is why every four years we have a leap year, correct? Well, they took, they, they, the, the Bible scholars have taken these dates that Artaxerxes spoke and said, y'all go home. And 483 years to the day, April 6, 32 A.D., Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey to the shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna, praise God, to people waving palm branches, to people taking off their coats and spreading them in the road so that the donkey would walk on their coats. And if Jesus would have allowed it, at that triumphal entry, the people would have made him king over Israel. But Jesus wouldn't allow it. Number one, the Romans wouldn't have been real happy about it, correct? They were king. Caesar was king. 
But second of all, Jesus knew that this was the date that God had told Daniel that he was to ride into the city. But Jesus also recognized that the people didn't get it. Because the same people who were shouting, Hosanna, 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 one week later were yelling, crucifying, crucifying, crucifying. After his triumphal entry later that afternoon, Jesus walked back up onto a hill overlooking the city. And according to, according to Luke, according to Luke chapter 19, he wept over Jerusalem and he said, if you had only known. This was the day that God planned to bring you peace. Not just peace from Rome, but peace for eternity. And you didn't get it. And the scripture says that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He wept over Jerusalem. The 483 year period was stopped. Was, was complete. There are still seven years left to complete. On the front of your bulletin, Miss Miriam put a clock. And the hands, the hands of the clock are almost to the 12. But if you'll look, the minute hand is still slightly, slightly off from 12 o'clock. That's because there are seven years left to go in God's plan, in God's prophetic clock for Israel. And, but the, the, the 483 year period was complete. What a confirmation. What a confirmation of God's word. 483 years after the prophecy to the day Jesus fulfilled the prophecy. Well, you reckon Jesus knew that prophecy? Yeah, he had a hand in writing it. Jesus was God. He had a hand in writing that prophecy. He knew exactly when Artaxerxes was going to do that. He knew exactly when he needed to go into Jerusalem. And so, tremendous confirmation. Of, 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 of God's word, in God's word. Let's look at the timeline just briefly. After this, three events occurred toward the, uh, after the end of those 483 years and before the beginning of the final seven years, okay? So the first, the first event was the crucifixion of Jesus. There in, in, in uh, back in Daniel 9, in verse 26, after 62 weeks of years, 483 years, Messiah will be cut off and have nothing left for himself. This is one of the clearest testimonies that's given in prophesying Jesus' uh, 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 crucifixion, his death on the cross. And so that was accomplished one week after the people were shouting Hosanna. They yelled crucify. Second was uh, the, the middle section of that verse, the middle segment of that verse 26. The people of the coming prince will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay? When, when Artaxerxes sent back uh, uh, Ezra and the, the people who wanted to go back to rebuild the wall, rebuild the temple, and rebuild the city, 
That was the second temple. Because Nebuchadnezzar had torn down Solomon's temple, the first temple. Ezra's temple was rebuilt on the site, but the people who were old enough when they went into captivity, the 70 years, and then were still alive to come home, Scripture says they wept because the glory of the second temple was very pale in comparison to Solomon's temple. And they wept. Of course, the younger people had never seen Solomon's temple, and they were just delighted to have a temple, period. Well, so the people of the coming prince will destroy the city again and the temple again. And he's talking about Ezra's temple, which was not yet built. And the prophecy is about Titus, the Roman general who came through Babylon, uh, came through the Holy Land, conquered it, once again, leveled the city, burned the gates, and destroyed Ezra's temple. This is the temple that Jesus taught in, where he said there won't be one stone left on top of another. And Titus literally <coughs> burned the city, knocked it all down, and plowed it under with oxen and plows to where Jerusalem was non-existent. Plowed it under. And this was the people of the coming prince, 70 AD. 70 AD, when, when Titus came through and destroyed that. Titus was a foreshadow of the Antichrist. A foreshadow of the Antichrist. He's not the Antichrist, but he was a picture. All those 2,000 years ago, a picture of the Antichrist <clears throat> who will rule during the last seven years, right, with the clock hands, during the last seven years of Israel's history, Antichrist will rule then throughout that seven year tribulation period. And at, at the beginning of the tribulation, Antichrist will allow, he'll make a peace treaty with the Jews and allow them to build the third temple. And they have been gathering materials for that temple for about 60 years now. Huge stockpiles of stones, huge stockpiles of lumber, of precious metals, of gold and silver to reinvent, if you want to, to recreate all of the artifacts that Moses pointed out in the Pentateuch. And the bulk of those materials are already stockpiled in Israel, waiting on the ability to rebuild that temple. Antichrist, uh, in, in Daniel chapter 7, you remember Daniel talks about a, a beast that has 10 horns, has 10 heads, 10 horns, and then uh, that's talking about the, the European Union. And then he says, and then another small horn grows up, and that is Antichrist. That is Antichrist. Antichrist is also named the beast in Revelation chapter 13. And we'll talk more about these as we go, all right? Then the third thing that, uh, that occurred after, uh, during this timeout period, 
is that wars will continue nonstop until the 70th seven. All right? Uh, again, back in, in verse 20, uh, 26, the end will come like a flood until the end, and, and until the end there will be wars, and desolations are decreed. Uh, and, and, and so this is, we're, we're in a timeout. The 483 years are fulfilled. We're in a timeout before God starts the final seven years. Think of it, think of it like a timeout at the end of a football game. End of the fourth quarter, 10 seconds left in the game, and coach calls a timeout. Calls a timeout with 10 seconds left. Everybody in the stands is going, play ball, play ball, play ball. Come on, let's get the thing going. <laughs> Sitting at home watching the game. We're going, play ball, play ball. Oh, well, I'll go get me another Coke. I'll go get me another handful of cookies. Because during that time out, they're going to play some commercials, you know, and I've got plenty of time. But you see, stop and think. How long is a football game? How, how long do the, do the two teams play in a football game? Four quarters. How long, are the quarter, how long is each quarter, Wayne? Fifteen minutes. Football game is 60 minutes long, but not really. Because from kickoff to final buzzer is generally almost three hours. So a football game is 60 minutes long, but not really. God's plan for Israel is 490 years long, but not really. We're in a timeout. We're in a timeout. We're waiting for God. We're waiting for God. To blow the whistle, except he's not going to blow a whistle. He's going to sound a trumpet. And he's going to tell Jesus, you go get my kids. You bring them home. Because literally, literally, all hell is going to break loose on this earth. Go get my kids. Bring them home. You see, God's, God's plan for Israel hasn't changed. His timing hasn't changed. It's just we're not paying attention to the timeouts. We're going to the bathroom during the timeout. We're going to get another drink in the timeout. We're going to get something else to eat in the timeout. And God says, hey, it, it's okay. I've got this. It's all on schedule. It's all right on schedule. The time period between the crucifixion of Jesus and his second coming is known in theological circles, and I'm not in theological circles. I've read this, okay? I remember this in seminary, but I've never talked to anybody else who's ever called it this except my seminary professors and a couple of theologians that Pastor Ronnie has asked me to read about. It's called the great parenthesis. We, who don't understand the great parenthesis, we call it the church age. From Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection until the rapture is called the church age. We understand that term. At the end of the church age, Jesus is going to take us out of here. Right? And the final seven years, that tribulation period, will begin. Well, how close are we? I don't know, but we're, we're at least, I can speak of 69 years. We're at least 69 years closer to that trumpet than we were when I was born. Okay? God is not slack concerning his promises. 
he's going to send Jesus back. Now this is going to be like when you go to the movies on Saturday afternoon when you're a kid and they showed the serial movies and they they run you up and man you're watching, watching, watching and all of a sudden the projector goes off and, you, and they're right before shooting the bad guys or they're right before whatever the Indian is attacking or they're right before and the theater goes dark and you go, oh man! Why? And that's what we're going to do right now. This is today's message. But it's going to continue next week. So don't throw stuff at me. Next week we're going to look at some of the specific signs. We'll look at Antichrist. We'll look at the Battle of Armageddon. Second Coming. Things like that. Next Sunday. So bring somebody with you. We're going to have a good time. And, but I, I want you to understand. The purpose, the purpose of prophecy is not to scare people. The purpose of prophecy is not to make us sweat and be afraid and go, I just, I don't know what to do. God's told us what to do. The purpose of prophecy is twofold. Number one, it calls us to holy living. And number two, it calls us to evangelism. Because you see, when God sounds the trumpet, it's going to be too late for some folks to call on Jesus. It's going to be too late for us to say, Oh, I meant to talk to my grandson. I meant to talk to my granddaughter. It's going to be too late. It's going to be too late for you to say, Oh, I meant to talk to my neighbor. We only lived across the street from him for 38 years, and I didn't have time to talk to him. We did. <laughs> They're 38 years. God calls us to holy living. Why? Because our lives are to be different from the lives of other people that we're around. Our lives are to be clean and holy and pure and, tr and, and, and drawing people to Christ. Jesus said, if, I leave, if, if, I, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men and women and kids to me. That's our job is to lift up Jesus by living a clean, pure, holy life. So that people come to us and say, why are you so different? And we can look at them and say, it's because of Jesus. He's, he's given me peace that passes all understanding. He's given me a love for him and for people that is beyond all understanding. Let me share with you Jesus. Pastor, that's not my gift. Yeah, it is. You just haven't unwrapped it. God gave that gift to every one of us. He gave that responsibility to every one of us. How do we prepare then? Three ways. End of your bulletin. Be certain that you are a Christian. Be absolutely 100%, 110% that you are a Christian. <clears throat> Excuse me, Dr. Luke told us in, in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Number two, don't be caught off guard. Live a pure, holy life. Prophecy is designed to call us to holy living and to evangelism. And number three, plan like Jesus wasn't coming back for another thousand years. But then live like he's coming back within the next ten minutes. Because we don't know when. And when he comes, Scripture says it will be in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and we'll be out and gone. And it will be too late talk to anybody else about Jesus. We're going
gonna we're gonna have a hymn of invitation. And I hope that that you'll take this this hymn time. And that you'll make a fresh commitment to God toward holy living, toward evangelism, toward God, give me holy boldness like I've never had before in my life. God, I don't know about my grandkids. I don't know about my neighbor. I don't know about that gal I used to work with, that guy I used to work with. I don't think they're saved. Now is the time to share with them before it's too late. Let's stand together. Miss Katrina, lead us in singing, please. more answers. <laughs> but God, some of the answers you've already given us literally just scare us to death. So it's probably just as well that you didn't give us all of them. But God, would you deliver us from fear? Would you deliver us into your power, into your strength, into your boldness? Deliver us from our cowardness and give us your boldness to speak to other people about our precious Lord and how they can spend eternity in heaven with you as well. God, give us safety as we go home. Give us a great week. Help us speak to people in Jesus' name. And it's in that name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I love you. Thanks for coming this morning.